The high-profile conviction of Russian national Maria Butina on charges of espionage against the American government has taken a back seat in the mainstream media until recently, as Russia continues to deny the 30-year-old's links to its security services. Butina moved to the U.S. in 2016 on a student visa. There she established links with like-minded activists in the National Rifle Association. In July 2018, Maria was arrested in Washington and charged with acting as an agent of a foreign government. Having spent a number of months behind bars, she reached a deal with the US Justice Department and pleaded guilty. Again, Moscow denies any connection and says she was pressured into a confession. Well, to discuss Maria Butina's case and her prison conditions. We can speak exclusively now to her lawyer, Robert Driscoll. Robert, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Firstly, what are Maria's current conditions like? Because earlier we heard she was being held essentially in solitary confinement. Has that altered? It has. Um, for the last several weeks, she's been in the general population at Alexander Detention Center. Uh, that's certainly not uh, a bargain that the average citizen would want to have, but um, it's better than uh, the isolation that she faced for about four months of her incarceration. In terms of developments in her case, have there been any? Well, we've um, uh, entered a plea agreement. Um, uh, she did not plead guilty to espionage, and she was not even charged with espionage. Um, she pled guilty to a very obscure... U.S. statute for essentially acting as a uh, as an agent of a foreign official, um, uh, but the agent was not was not a spying case at all. It was simply her completing tasks at the behest of a foreign official. It had nothing to do with covert operations or with undermining America. And so I'm trying to you know get that straight as we work towards the sentencing. Um, but she, her her plea agreement is done. Um, she's been uh, telling the government what little she knows. And we're hoping to have a sentencing set in the next month and hoping uh, that she'll be home fairly soon after that. I'm hopeful that she'll be home, um, you know, within, within uh, a month or six weeks. Just to focus a little bit on that, uh, what, what you're saying, what the defence has been pursuing since the right. guilty plea back in December. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that part of what I'm trying to just make clear and, and, and talk to people about is the fact that um, although this case was kind of presented as a Red Sparrow type of espionage case, uh, the U.S. government never uh, had any evidence that Maria was a spy, uh, was a member of the FSB or the SBR or any Russian intelligence service, um, nor did they, was there any evidence in the case of any covert communication or dead drops or money changing hands. I mean, this was simply um, um, you know, even accepting the government's theory is true, which we mm. did for purposes of taking the plea to resolve the case. Um, she was a, 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 a essentially looking for better relations between the two countries, undertook some activities in that regard, and should have registered with the attorney general prior to doing that. So I think she really, um, uh, you know, whatever, even the U.S. government, I think, would acknowledge at this point that she's not uh, a spy or a, a, any kind of some person looking to undermine the United States. And I think that'll be reflected, hopefully, when we get to sentencing in this case. There has been a lot of discussion, a lot of talk that Maria was perhaps pressured in some way into a plea deal. Can you comment on that? Well, I mean, I think she, she entered the plea, and there's a, there's a big process in the United States when you enter a plea agreement where the judge asks a whole lot of questions about whether you've entered into the plea voluntarily. Um, you know, and so I think it really depends on how one looks at it. I think she entered the plea voluntarily and that she knew what her options were. Uh, I explained the law to her. Uh, she knew what she was pleading guilty to. Uh, what I would say is that it's always hard in the U.S. Uh, in criminal cases. There's typically a plea bargain option. And in this case, um, she'll be home, I think, prior to when a trial would have happened if we had not taken the plea. Um, and so, I mean, given the fact that, uh, I mean, I told her as her attorney, we could win the case, but if we won the case in June, you know, she'd be deported right after that. So if, um, if we can get her home before that, I think that may make sense. And so I think that the key is to look at the 
statement of the offense of what she pled to, and people, I think, will see that she really didn't plead to anything uh, as, I guess, uh, uh, sexy or exciting as the media has made it out to be. It, it is closer to a registration violation than anything else. And I think hopefully, if everyone's in agreement when we get to the sentencing, the court and the prosecution will agree and we'll get her uh, back home to her family in Barnall uh, as soon as possible. Your, uh, her family will be very, uh, well, it'll give them some hope that your, your comments, has she been allowed to contact them, do you know? Yeah, she, she's able, um, the, the phone service has been somewhat spotty at times. But I know that she, uh, during her time, she's been able to talk to her father uh, and sometimes her mother and sister, mm -hmm. you know, once a week or twice a week uh, on occasion from the jail. Um, you know, those are calls you have to pay for and they're very expensive, but she has friends and family that deposit money into her phone account and she's able to call home once in a while um, and, and update them on her status, which is good. Now, the lines are always recorded, uh, so you can't really have a private conversation because people are always listening in. But it's, uh, it's still better than nothing, and it's at least a way for her to keep contact with her family. I know particularly her grandmother, she misses greatly and wants to make sure she's home, uh, home to see her grandmother is quite elderly. How do you assess her health at this point? Um, because after being in solitary confinement, right. it would not have been ideal, but she's been out of there for some time. Has she been recovering, or what's the current situation? Yeah, she, she's... Um, I mean, again, I think it's all in context. Uh, I don't think any of us would want to be in the condition she's in, but I think overall she's better than she was. I mean, I think she's, um, for those that probably know her, I think she's probably a bit thin. Um, you know, I think jail food is, is not great. Um, but I think mentally uh, having some contact with people is much better for her. We, the lawyers, try to get in and see her. You know, there's two lawyers, uh, Alfred Carey and myself, and we pretty much split evenings and, and go see her almost every day um, to at least give her an hour outside of the unit to, to meet with her attorneys. The consulate visits her uh, once a week. So she's getting, you know, regular, her priest visits her, I think, every other week. So, but I think her, overall, her, her mental outlook is the most important thing and has improved a lot. And I think she can somewhat see the light at the end of the tunnel. And physically, her, I know her leg's feeling better because she got some warmer, um, some warmer conditions in Alexandria than she did in Washington. So I think overall her health is her health is good. Just on the point about solitary confinement, Robert, um, was there any justification for her to be there at that time? The the purported justification was uh, that it was an administrative segregation um, because she was a high profile prisoner. It, it is a problem that is I think the international audience should know. It's much broader than this case in the United States. Uh, and it's a real question of whether or not solitary confinement is overused and used um, kind of for inadequate reasons in the United States. Because he was not put in solitary allegedly for punishment, so there was nothing to appeal. I filed a motion with the court trying to get her taken out of solitary, and the court wouldn't even hear my motion. So the jailers have pretty much uh, open discretion to keep um, prisoners in solitary for, for you know, periods of mm. time, uh, either for their own convenience or to allegedly to protect the prisoner. But I think that internationally, most people, I think Amnesty International and others, view more than a week or two in solitary as something that's uh, inappropriate. And yet, I mean, I won't, don't want people to think there's only Maria. There are people in Alexandria jail that are thrown into 30 days of solitary on a, on a mm. fairly routine basis. Uh, you're able to speak to us now. We're it's very a, glad you are giving situation. us absolutely giving us an insight but that hasn't always been the case Robert was it there has been a ban on journalists right. speaking on this case there, there was a well there wasn't a ban on journalists but there was a gag order implemented sure. on me um, and on Maria um, by the judge uh, that that order the judge took briefing on it and lifted it after the plea agreement um, but yes there was initially and it was frustrating for me because as it turns out, um, my complaints were that the, I said the government's allegations about uh, Maria allegedly trading sex for positions of power was false. That ended up being true. The government, you know, withdrew their allegations. The government admitted they were wrong. Uh, I complained about financial information being leaked that was untrue. Uh, that ended up, I was correct. And uh, in fact, a woman from the Department of Treasury has been indicted for illegally <laughs> uh, leaking that information. And so it was very frustrating because at the time I was trying to, I thought, correct the record. 
But uh, when there's a criminal trial pending, the judge has the power to make the parties and lawyers be quiet. And so the judge did. The judge has since lifted that order a couple of weeks ago. I've been very um, sparing in terms of talking to journalists, just because I want everything with the court to go well for Maria's sentencing. But I, I did feel like um, uh, I wanted particularly people in Russia and her family to have an update as to how she was doing and to know that, well, there are no guarantees. We don't know what will happen with the judge and how the judge will move. Um, I'm optimistic that if we get a sentencing hearing in the next you know, several weeks, uh, that we can hopefully uh, get her home uh, as soon as possible. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can achieve that for her. Robert, on, on earlier cases that I've covered here on the program, when we're talking about Russian individuals being charged in the US, there seems to be an automatic link to the Russian state. Was that difficult for you trying to organize a case that it was seen perhaps by Americans, right. by um, judges that, you know, this is almost a given that this is what's happening and not an individual case? Now, I, I do think um, it, that, is, that, is a, uh, that is a problem that needs to be overcome when you have a case like this. And all I could really do is wait to go through the evidence and a lot of the defense and working with the government to get them to a point where, you know, we're, we had a, a plea deal that I thought was reasonable that we get her home sooner was to just point, it was almost to the absence of evidence that, okay, uh, you know, w w where is the communication to anyone in, in the, the intelligence agencies? I don't, I don't see it. Mm. Where are there any, you know, covert types of things? Um, she met, frankly, ironically, she met several people uh, who she did not pursue social or other relationships with, who presumably she would have were she on a mission from the Russian government. Um, you know, it, it, and mm. so I think those kind of things ended up at least allowing me to mitigate things in her favor. I think there's a technical violation that she made. She's willing to accept responsibility for that. But the reality is she was really seeking peace. Um, it's an odd kind of case that you have someone who viewed herself as a peace builder, wanted to build bridges between the two com countries in the private sphere, mm. uh, and ended up getting caught up in this. And I think it's unfortunate. I, I'm always curious, people in the U.S. media ask sometimes if she's afraid to go home, and I say, why would she be? <laughs> you know, um, mm. if, if anybody knows she's not a Russian agent, it's uh, the Russian agencies who, do, who don't employ her. So um, I, I think okay. she's looking forward to going home. And I think that uh, uh, hopefully, you know, she's she'll if I do a good job, we can you know get her out in the next month or two months or six weeks or something like that.